All right, folks. Good to have you. Good to be everybody here. We'll turn John chapter 16. We'll get back into our lesson today. The 16th chapter of John. John 16. Father, give me wisdom, Lord. Give me wisdom in your word. I pray this now in Jesus' name. And Father, give us a heart to receive it, ears to hear it. Thy name we pray. Amen. All right, John 16, we have, uh, if you'll notice the coming of the Holy Spirit into the world, uh, he told them in John 16, verse 7, he says, it's, spe it's expedient for you that I go away. In plain words, it's to your benefit and great benefit. He said, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. In other words, they cannot both exercise the same office at the same time simultaneously. The Holy Spirit is in the world representing or as Christ, but he couldn't be that with Christ here personally. So what we have here in John 16, if you'll notice in verse number 8, when he has come, he'll do three things. And the three things that he does are very important because it summarizes the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world. And that's this. Number one, he will reprove or convict the world of sin. Number two, and of righteousness, and number three, and of judgment. Of sin, because they, believe not, uh, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now last week we talked about the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit of sin, because they believe not on me. And I'll, I'll not go back through all of that, but just to remind you, that uh, the condemnation of this world is not for fornication, adultery, and lying, thieving, murder, and deceit, and all the rest of the sins that are mentioned in the Scripture. The condemnation is this. This is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. They reject the only solution or the only provision that God has or ever will give for sin, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, by rejecting him, they have sinned against the Holy Spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit is to convince men of sin because they believe not on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So that is, con that is sinning against the Holy Spirit. Any sin is against God. And obviously you all know that because uh, sin is a violation of God's holiness and righteousness and his sovereign reign on this earth, his sovereign reign in the universe and his creation. So when an individual sins, he has broken that and violated God's, uh, God's sovereignty. But the issue here is not individual sins. The issue here is the sin that condemns the sinner. And that's that. That's it. It's rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, the light. And uh, he said that uh, if in John chapter number 9, he said, If I had not come and preached unto you and brought unto you this gospel, you would not have had sin. But now you say you believe, therefore your sin remaineth. And that's because they had rejected the light. Now notice the second thing here in verse number 10. He convinces the world of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Now this has to do with the sinless, perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore there's something about the sinless, perfect life of the Son of God that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of or brings to their attention and calls their attention to. And this is the part that uh, for 2,000 years the church has been very lax in understanding that when God Almighty was manifest in the flesh, we had the God-man walking on this earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ as the God-man was no less God than God the Father. Well, the Bible says in Colossians 2, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But he subjected himself to the Father as the obedient servant of the Lord. In uh, Isaiah chapter number 40, obedient unto the Father because he was going to be the Savior of the world and give himself as a sacrifice to fulfill the Father's will. So the Godhead is manifesting itself and operating 
in uh, perfect unity in conjunction as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's a fact. But Jesus Christ is God. Amen. Not a God, not part of God. He's God. Amen. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So therefore, when the Lord Jesus Christ came to the world, God judges men for their, uh, for their uh, righteousness, for their lack of it, because there, are, there is none righteous, no, not one. He judges men for their rebellion. But the truth of the matter is, God judges, God the Father judges from a position of holiness, righteousness, separation from sin, whose eyes are too pure to even look upon it. So therefore, the judgment of God upon sin must fall upon one who has the right to do it. In other words, he has earned that right, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived on this earth for 33 and one-half years, breathing the same air you breathe, walking in the same, on the same dirt you walk on, and experiencing the same things you experience. Now, that's something that a person ought to spend some time in meditation on. You ought to think about that. You ought to really think about that. And here's, here's some of the things that the Bible says about that. It says in the book of uh, First Corinthians, uh, Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 15. Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 15. Now, when you think about what he's saying to the Hebrews, because the writer of this book is addressing Hebrews, not ignorant Gentiles, as the apostle was in the book of Romans, but he's addressing Hebrews, people supposed to be versed in the Scripture. And Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 15. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. All right. In plainer words, he lived in this world under the same circumstances that you live under, enduring the same things that you endure, facing the same problems you face and being assaulted by the same devil that you're assaulted by. A lot, of, a lot has been said about the terminology, he was tempted, like in all points, like as we are. Saying that the word itself is a mistranslation should simply say he was tested. Let me tell you what the Greek word translated here is. It's perazzo. It's... Uh, Pi, Epsilon, Iota, uh, Rho, Alpha, Zeta, uh, and uh, Omega, okay? Those are the Greek letters that make up the Greek word. And it has a double meaning. It has a negative meaning and it has a positive meaning. Let me tell you what Strong says. He says that uh, the AV translates as tempt 29 times, try four times, tempter twice, prove once, assay once, Examine once and go about once to try whether a thing can be done as to attempt, endeavor, to try, make trial of, test for the purpose of ascertaining its quality or what he thinks or how he will behave himself as in a good sense. In a bad sense, to test one maliciously, craftily, to put to the proof his feelings or judgments to try to or test one's faith, virtue, character by enticement to sin, to solicit to sin, to tempt. Uh, he uses some illustrations of the temptations of the devil and so forth and so on. Now, there are some things said about God. The scripture says God cannot tempt one to evil. He tempteth no man. James says that every man is tempted when he is led away by his own lust and enticed. Therefore, where does the temptation arise? From without or from within? From within. The reason that if something is presented to you that will cause you to be tempted, the same thing can be presented to Christ which will cause him to be tested, to prove his mettle. To prove his righteousness. You understand? For me it may be a temptation to sin. For him there is no temptation to sin. For him it is a proof of his righteousness and his holiness. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was ever tempted to sin? I do not. 
One of the reasons that I do not, he, do not believe he was ever tempt, tempted to sin, number one, there never arose from within him any desire to tempt sin. Number two, he did not have the fallen nature that you have, that you were born with. He didn't have that. He did not have corrupt blood that you were born with. For the blood that ran in his vein was the blood of God. He came into this world completely and totally obedient to the Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ, when temptation was presented, that would be temptation to you, could only prove Him to be true, faithful, righteous, and holy. That's why the word is it. The word is a double meaning. It has, it has a both a positive, negative, a good, and a bad sense in which it can be used. And all of us, of course, have been tempted. Every man is tempted. We've all been tempted, every last one of us. You'll be tempted again probably before the week's out. The first day of the week, you got six more. Before it's out, you probably will be. But he was never, he, he, he never, uh, he was never tempted, not, not in the sense that you are, because of the sense of the, word, the way the word is used. So in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 30, I want you to look carefully at this. Now, these things that I'm giving you are very important, <laughs> very important. For whole systems of theology are built upon the idea that a man can earn or attain to his righteousness. And you cannot do it. First Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. One of the things that the Holy Spirit will convince the world of, according to John chapter number 16, is of what? Let's go back and read it again. John 16. Three things here. Okay. Number one, he'll convince the world of sin. Number two, of righteousness. Number three, of judgment. So therefore, righteousness is the second thing the Holy Spirit will convince the world of. To prove that Jesus Christ was completely and absolutely righteous. Now, sinless is one thing. Righteous is, righteous is something else. Obviously, you would have to be sinless to be righteous. But righteousness is something that is hammered out and worked out and developed in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. For from the time that he was born on this earth, born by the power of the Holy Spirit, until the time that he yielded himself up by the Spirit on the cross. For the Bible says that he offered himself through the Spirit, by the Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. In other words, it wasn't just an arbitrary death saying, Lord, I hope you receive this death. You know, I believe this thing for me to do. No, he was led by the Spirit to the cross, just like he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So when he offered himself, the Bible said, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God. All right. From the first, first breath of his body to the last breath from his body, the Lord Jesus Christ was absolutely and completely obedient to the Father. Therefore, that obedience was established a righteousness. It established a righteousness of a man. That righteousness never existed before. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world, lived a sinless, perfect life for 33 and one half years, at the last event of this earth, the earth could no longer hold him. He ascended. He ascended to the Father because for the 40 days that he had spent on this earth after his resurrection, he completed what God gave him to do. Now, it had nothing to do with salvation. Salvation was completed at the cross, but he completed his mission in those 40 days, time of testing, time of trial. That's what 40 represents. So when it was done, when nothing else could be done, nothing else will be done, as it relates to God's relationship to man, the Lord Jesus Christ consummated all of it. Nothing else can be done. The earth had to turn loose of him. Just like the grave had to turn loose of him, the earth had to turn loose of him, and he ascended. And he is the only one to ever ascend by his own righteousness. Yeah. And so into the very presence of God the Father, the eternal, almighty invisible spirit being, holy, 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 into his presence, into his righteousness, the righteousness of God approaches the righteousness of a man. And that righteousness was accepted. And in the book of Revelation, if you'll notice, there's one sitting on the throne, and if you'll notice, there's one before him, and if you'll notice, the one before him is as it a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. 
So the Lord Jesus Christ entered heaven with the righteousness of a man. And that righteousness was accepted. And that is the righteousness that God applies to every last believer because the believer is judged by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your life will be judged according to his life. The holiness, righteousness, and all these standards of the Old Testament, these are wonderful things. But in the Old Testament, God had never lived on this earth. Now he has. And so therefore, if you consider yourself righteous and consider yourself holy and think your good works are going to get you into glory, then God says, that's just fine. We're going to take him. We're going to stand you here. And we're going to stand the Lord Jesus here. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Guess which one's going to win? <laughs> I can tell you ahead of time. You lost. And so that's what it is. That's what he's talking about here in John 16. Of righteousness because he goes to his Father. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who can ascend to the holy mountain of God? Only the righteous. Only the holy. I told you about the song of degrees last week. When Hezekiah had uh, uh, put them into the Psalms. The steps. The, the steps. At the time of Selah. Selah. Every time they stopped they'd say Selah. And then they'd take another step. Another step. Another step. As they approached God. It's something to think about. It's something to be solemn over. And who can approach God? Would you dare approach Him if you're not right? Would you dare come to His presence if you're not ready? There's a whole lot of places you can go besides the presence of God. <laughs> you can, uh, so well, that's the issue. All right, number three. John chapter number 16. And number three here. Let's go back and read it again. John 16, verse 3. And then of judgment. Now here's what he says. Notice carefully. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now, Jacob had 12 sons. One of them's name means judgment. You know which one it is? Judge. It means judge, judgment. Judah means praise. And uh, Judas was the counterpart in the New Testament, which was a completely opposite. One, one son of Jacob meant judgment, judge. Dan. The tribe of Dan. And if you'll remember, the, the, the boundaries of Israel were laid out, geographical boundaries of Israel were laid out from Dan in the north to where in the south? Beersheba. And that means the, the, the well of the sheep. All right. Uh, so from north Dan all the way to Beersheba in the south, th this was the boundary. All right. And when Israel apostatized and set up... Uh, Went up to the north, set their own. You remember who did that? When Solomon died, uh, we had two men vying for the throne. <clears throat> and uh, one was the son of Solomon. The other one was a uh, usurper who took ten... Who? Uh, Reboam was Solomon's son. What was the other one's name? Who took the ten northern tribes? Jeroboam. He set up a golden calf. He set up an image in the north. Not only did he do that, but he created his own priesthood. He created his own priesthood. Had them call them father. And, and he did this in opposition to the true priesthood of the south, which was in Judah. So uh, God judged them through Dan. And his name is true. It meant, it meant true to character. For they were judged through Dan, and they were judged, and the Assyrians literally destroyed their identity. Cap carried them captive and mixed and mingled with them. And, uh, and, and, uh, and you know... Uh, they created Samaritans from it. That's what they were. That's where the Samaritans came from. And the two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah, were the ones who retained the land, retained the kingdom, retained the capital, and all of that. It's not to say that you can't find one of the, twelve, of the ten northern tribes, because you can. In the New Testament, it tells you plainly that uh, when uh, uh, Anna, the Bible says, was of the tribe of Come on, folks. Anna. we got Simeon who held up the Lord Jesus and said, I Behold, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And Anna was a widow, the Bible said, who'd been in the temple. She was 80-something years old. And she was of the tribe of Asher. All right? Asher is one of the ten northern tribes, not the two southern tribes. So obviously, all that means is that 2,000 years ago, long after the mixing up of the ten northern tribes, we still had identity attached to the individual tribes. Okay. So, uh, Dan means judgment. For judgment, therefore, I am coming to the world, he said. Judgment. The presence of the Lord Jesus Christ brought judgment. J and judgment the sense that Him being there, 
is a voice. It's a, it's a voice that speaks. It brings judgment. Now, notice he said, the prince of this world is judged. Who's that? All right, that's the devil. Okay. All right. The word devil is uh, diablos. All right. All right. What, what, does, what is that? Is that a name or is that a, uh, just a kind of a title? Kind of a generic term. Have you, anybody ever called you a devil? I've been called a devil more than one time. All right. A devil is a generic term. It's not necessarily a name. Satan is a name. Lucifer is a name. These are names, just like Jehovah is a name, or Jesus is a name, Michael, so forth. All right. The prince of this world is judged. So therefore, when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, his coming into this world had something to do with God Almighty and his judgment on Satan. That's what he's saying. He's saying that the prince of this world who has had dominion and authority over this world, and he has. And where do you get it from? You remember what he said to the Lord in the, in, the, in the wilderness? He said, all this has been given to me. Who gave it to him? Who? It, indirectly he did. He did. God's the one who bestowed the power, but he took it from Adam and gave it to the devil. Why did he do that? When Adam was created and placed in that garden, he said, Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. Adam was a king. He was a king over the earth. He was a king over the kingdom of, of, of heaven. And he was a king over the kingdom of God. Adam was both a physical and a spiritual king. He had both. Having never sinned, created, uh, created innocent, uh, Adam was, had authority. He had, he, had, he, had, he had, what's the word for it? He was... He was, he, was, he was capable of ruling over the kingdom of God but, uh, and also over the kingdom of heaven. At that time, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven were concurrent. They were simultaneous. They were running together. They were in the same place at the same time. They are not the same. But at times, they are together in the same time, in the same place. And so Adam lost that when he sinned. So therefore the devil had more in mind than simply causing the downfall of man. The devil had a lot in mind when he approached Adam. He had a lot in mind. He had already been cast down. Ezekiel chapter 28 said that thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. All right. That's how he was created. And that's a side study, but when you look at it, you'll find out to, that covering has to do with the fact that Satan was literally higher than the angels. He was, a, he was a leader in the worship of God. Therefore, Satan knew all about the Holy of Holies. He knew about the presence of God. He knew about that which was spiritual. In plainer words, the fall of Satan was from a high vaulted position, and his final doom will be the lowest of all positions. He came from the highest to the lowest, but his fall from the highest to the lowest is not one event. It's a progression of events. Satan's fall from his place of the highest to the eventual place of the lowest has to do with each time with a challenge and an opportunity and a responsibility that's given to him. And in every case he fails. And I personally believe, I personally believe that it's God proving a point in Satan. He's an object lesson. Remember what the Lord said about Pharaoh. What did God say about Pharaoh? When he, what did he say about him in the Old Testament? He said, what now? He said, for this cause have I raised thee up. God said, I raised thee up. Now hold on a minute. <laughs> Whose side is God on? When he told Moses to go in before him and declare, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. But on the other hand, God said, I raised thee up, Pharaoh. See what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that there's the mind of God and then our little pea-picking mind that can pick a little bit and find out a little bit and understand somewhat by observation and research. But the truth of the matter is He is so far above us that His ways are not our ways. His mind is not our mind. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We discover things, react to situations, learn things. God has never learned anything, reacted to any situation, nor discovered anything. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here, according to Hebrews chapter number 5, learned the feeling of suffering as the man when God became a man. You understand that? 
That's why I tempted in all points as we are. It's what it says in Hebrews 5. When he was here, he physically felt it, therefore experienced it. And from that experience, the Lord Jesus Christ ministers right now as the high priest in heaven. Y'all follow me on this. All right. Now, I know I'm, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you quickly, but the truth of the matter is there is a battle raging and has raged all the way from the time that Satan was cast out of his place of authority in heaven till this present day, and it still rages. Remember Wednesday night when we talked about the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only who who letteth will now let, the old English word let means to keep or hinder or hold back, he that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. All right? So there's something going on here, right? There, there is a, there's a battle raging that's on the, that you don't see on the surface, but it's real. It's, going, it's, it's a real battle. The Apostle Paul said, we wrestle not. Wrestling is a battle, you know. It's, 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 it's a confrontation. He said, your adversary, the devil's roaring lion, walketh about. So we know that Satan is actively pursuing something. The book of Job shows us that. But... When the Lord Jesus came here 2,000 years ago, he said, Now is the prince of this world judged. Look over here in John chapter number 12, verse number 31. John 12, 31. John chapter number 12. Watch this now. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Notice the now. See, chronology, chronology, very important. Remember, I've told you before, time and again, timing is so important with God. Timing. Fact is, that's one of the most important things in the whole Bible, timing. At a certain time, God intends to do something. All right, now notice what he said here. Now is the judgment of this world. Now look at the context. John chapter number 12. Look at the context. What happens in the 11th chapter of John? That ought to be familiar to all of you. I mean, it's one of the most familiar things in the whole Bible. Lazarus is raised from the dead. All right? Lazarus is raised from the dead. All right? <clears throat> this is an obvious manifestation of divine power. This is something that just doesn't happen every day. How many dead people have you ever seen raised from the dead? Don't see it every day, do you? Can God raise the dead? Well, I certainly can. So in John 11, Lazarus is raised from the dead. All right, in John 12, verse 1, notice who shows up. Lazarus. You see, after he was raised from the dead, the Bible says a few things about him. He's here and he's there. And in plain of words, he's among the people and they look at him and say, that was the man that was dead. You know, I, I don't know about you. But if, if, if I knew somebody in this house had been dead and God raised them from the dead, you can count on it. I'd have a few questions. <laughs> Believe me, I would. So the, uh, John, uh, Lazarus is here, all right? What did they do with that, this, this knowledge that he was raised from the dead? Verse 10. John 12. But the chief priest consulted that they might what? They want to kill him again. Now how far do you have to go to do this? How far are you going to do this? You're not only a murderer, there's a motive in the murder. What's going on here? Your religion is more important than the obvious power of God. Do you think that's around today? Certainly it is. Absolutely. 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 The Lord said to, well, they call him Dives, whatever his name was, the rich man died and went to hell in Luke 16. He said, let me go back to one of my five brothers. He said, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Hey, nay, Father Abraham, if one go to them from the dead, they will surely believe. Right? That's what he said. Well, here's one who went to them from the dead. Did they believe? No. Do you know Why? There is more power in the Word of God. You know why? It's alive. Than even someone who walked into this house raised from the dead. That's the truth. That's what it says. But, but the truth is they rejected him because of their motive. All right, here's the point. The point is the motive. All right? The point is the motive. 
John 12, verse, uh, verse 10, they consulted they might put Lazarus to death. Now, if you read these Gospels and read about these Jews and read about these Jewish leaders, these priests, these scribes and Pharisees, you can't help but come away with the idea, man, these people meant business. They absolutely meant to do away with this man and any evidence or anything that supported him. They were going to do away with this man. That's, that's what you get from it, right? They were completely set in their unbelief. See the point? They were set in it. They rejected the truth even though it slapped them right in the face. They were presented with the truth, I mean eyeball to eyeball, and they still said no to it. We're going to kill you, Lazarus. You're going to find out what it is to die twice. <laughs> they didn't deny that he was raised from the dead. It just didn't fit their religion. They would not have this man to reign over them. That, is that what it says? We will not have this man reign over us. To Pontius Pilate, when he said to these Jews, he said, I find no fault in this man. I wash my hands of his blood. What'd they say? Let his blood be on us. Oh, bless your soul, it has been. It has been. And so, how is the prince of this world judged then? What's going on here? See? See? You go to hell because you, because you follow the devil? No. You go to hell because you believe in the devil? No. Do you go to hell because you worship the devil? Sure not going to help you. <laughs> but no. There are many people preaching the word of God that used to worship the devil. No telling how many witches, ex-witches are in the church. And every time it's, a, it's, it's not evidence sign the victory of the cross. And the power of the blood yes, to change from a child of hell to a child of God. So what's going on here? Now is the judgment. All right, now let's go back and look at it for a minute. This is Nachash in Genesis chapter number 3. The Bible said the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. All right, serpent, serpent, okay. The serpent, it was not a creature crawling on the ground. That was the curse placed upon it. It was walking upright. As a matter of fact, I saw, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dor, Dor, Gustav Dor. How many's ever seen his, uh, his work? He lived in the 1800s. Well, you have. Most of you have probably seen it and didn't recognize it as his work. It's in the public domain now. He's been gone so long, you can use his work. But he has, he's got a, uh, he's got a, he's got a, uh, uh, how did they do it? Plate. They did something engraving. However, they did it back in the 1800s. He's got the devil walking upright on two feet. And he's got him as a half man and a half animal. Now, I don't know how close to reality this is, but he's got a better take on it than you're going to see in most people. The devil was not a snake wrapped around a tree offering an apple to Eve. Now, that's tradition. You know, that's for the funny books. The Hebrew word translated serpent, and this is important, is nachash. All right? It's that. All right? Nachash. That's the same thing that shows up later on in the book of Numbers is the fiery serpent. It is a creature, all right? It's a creature in the garden. What kind of a creature is it? I can't explain it, but the word itself means a brilliant, shining, spectacular-looking thing that literally mesmerized Eve. And when she looked at it, she was caught by its spell. It cast a spell upon her. And uh, this is what happened to her. And the Bible says this, though this is the point of all of it. That when God placed judgment on this creature, and if you'll notice how that God judges the creatures that Satan's associated with, he said, because thou hast done this thing. Does it say that in your Bible? Yeah, it does. Because thou hast done this thing. What thing? What's so important? What's the big deal going on here? What's so important to God? Well, the Bible said God took of the dust of the ground. He made a body. He breathed into that body the breath of life, and the man became a living soul, a tripart being. And then it says that he was made in the image of God. So Satan attacked this Adam made in the image of God. Why did he do that? Because he knew that if God is going to create a creature in his image. Now think about it for a minute. 
I want you to think. What's an angel look like? Well, everybody's seen angels. They're 33-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed females with wings. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, when angels show up in the Bible, they appear as men. And they, uh, they, they appear as men, and they don't necessarily draw attention to themselves unless they have an office or something they're doing. Okay? You know the angels that came over there in Sodom. That's a good illustration of it. Those Sodomites wanted those angels. They thought they were men. And uh, they had no idea what they were fooling with. They, knew they were angels. But in any event, an angel is, uh, is a created being. A seraphim is a created being. A cherubim is a created being. All right? Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that a cherubim or a seraphim or an angel was created in the image of God. Yet an angel can appear as a man. So what's going on? Man's created in the image of God, right? When you think about it, you're, you're, a, you're a peculiar creature because there's nothing else like you. Yet there's an awful lot of creatures that God's made. You see, there's two classes. Creature, creator. There's only one creator. Amen. Abides alone. He lives because he lives. Needs no source of anything. Has been from everlasting to everlasting. There's just one creator. But everything else is a creation or a creature. He gave you a capacity that you can't ever find ever mentioned in relationship to any other creature. And you know what that capacity is? He gave you an ability. Angels have wills. You have a will. Angels have intelligence. You have intelligence. Angels have, uh, they, obviously the, the scripture when it talks about angels, it talks about whether they can be obedient or not. Some angels fell, kept not their first estate. So what quality do you have that it, the Bible never says that an angel can do this. It never, I'm not saying that they cannot, but it never says that they ever have or can. What is that quality? That's it, brother. Love. And we are the object of his affection of love. And you can love him back. And you can mark this down in your book. He knows it if it's real. He knows it if you can love him for who he is. <laughs> Either you love him or you don't love him. You love him or you don't love him. <laughs> I love him. He knows I love him. The Bible never says one time, anywhere, if you can find it, show it to me, where an angel ever loved him. I'm not saying that they don't, but it's kind of strange that it never says they do. Does that make you think? What does that elevate you to? The capacity to love. What is that? How high does that lift up a man? What has he got in store for the man? Pardon? It's pretty high, isn't it? He's really got something big in store for us, doesn't he? He really does. A lot of people are obedient out of fear. You can be obedient out of fear. You know, I don't go to hell. <laughs> I'm going to do the best I can. That's one thing. But that's a motive that's self-serving. Right? Can God judge the motive? Certainly he can. But when one looks back up into the heavens with starry eyes and tears rolling down their cheeks and their mouth quivering, and they look up at him and said, You love me? I love you too. <laughs> that doesn't come from a cherubim. That doesn't come from a cerebrum. That certainly doesn't come from Satan or his kingdom. That can only come from you, a human being. Yes, sir. We start out as a bride of Christ, but we end up as a wife. Yeah, married to him. And it's that spiritual union that we have with him that will produce every child that's ever born in the future. Born of God, his bride. There will be none. Folks, there will be no, there is no future for mankind outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the future of mankind. 
There is no future. There is no future. And of course we understand it in the sense that there is no salvation. And that's great. That's true. That's very true. Now you'll hear me preach it a thousand times. Every time I can, I'm going to preach salvation. But salvation is saving you. The future is Christ. If you're going to be in the future, you're going to be in Christ. Because he is the second man, last Adam. Boy, what a thing. Isn't that remarkable? Kind of changes the picture a little bit, doesn't it? Kind of takes your focus off of the church. and Church has its place. Thank God for the church. Takes your focus off of people. Even takes your focus off of the commandments. And thank God for the good commandments. But that's not what it's about. All right. Now let me read to you this fellow here. I've got five minutes. This is a very brilliant man. He's brilliant. No question about it. His name is Albert Pike. He was the Grand Commander, 1859-1891. This is the morals and dogma, the accepted, ancient and accepted right, southern jurisdiction, so forth and so on. Here's what he says about Christian teachers. The teachers, even of Christianity, are in general the most ignorant of the true meaning of that which they teach. So immediately that tells me that Mr. Pike has taken a position of elitism. If you want to know what's going on, you check with him. Otherwise, you're groveling around in the dark. The problem is that his source of truth is not the Bible. Oh, he uses the Bible. But his source of truth is him because he judges all religions and pulls a little bit from all of them and creates his own religion. Here's what he said about the one that I love. This is very important. This is a big deal to me. Here's what he said. Lucifer, remember now we're talking about Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. See, what he's trying to say is that why are we calling him the light bearer when he's the, he's the prince of darkness? In other words, he says, see how inconsistent we are. Christians, he's talking about us. See how inconsistent you are with your naming. Now watch carefully. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Well, that's what the word means. It means son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light? Now he puts a question into your mind. All right. He puts a question, a doubt into your mind. Maybe it's not Jesus that's the light bearer. Maybe it really is Lucifer. Maybe there's a battle going on here. Maybe we can go back into time in memoriam and think about the fact that there is a conflict between two. You got it right? He had it right? That's very true. There is a conflict between Jesus Christ and Satan. There is a battle between the two of them. And the Lord Jesus Christ came into Satan's domain and stood eyeball to eyeball with him on his own turf. In other words, he played football game in his stadium against, had all of his cheering witnesses vastly outnumbered for the little handful of believers that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, nothing compared to the millions that Satan had who came against him. That's what it's about. All right. Now listen to this. It is he who bears the light and with its splendors, intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls. In plain words, Lucifer, the devil, is so brilliant in his truthful appearance that I, as a believer in Jesus Christ, groveling in the dark, can never even comprehend and receive how great and wonderful Lucifer truly is. That's what he said. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. Now go on. Doubt it not. In other words, doubt not the fact that he is the light, that he blinds those. And truthful to the scripture, the Bible says that he blinds the minds of them that believe not. Lucifer does. Doubt it not. For traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations, and inspiration is not of one age nor of one creed. Did you catch that? Do you understand what this man is? Do you understand what, he's, what, he, what did he just say to you? That inspiration is not of one nation or of one creed 
or of one religion. What he said by that statement is that there is an element of divine truth in all religions. And so it's our responsibility, our speaking of himself, not me, of him. It's our responsibility to glean the truth, put it together, and create our own religion. And that's exactly what he did. Now, why is this? What's, what's going on here? Why is this? Here's what he says on page 104. Masonry, like all the religions, what did he just tell you? All the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled. All right, now, why did I do that? Why did I take such a contrast like that and read that for you this morning? Because I want to show you the nature of the battle. Okay? That's what it's for. It's to show you the nature of the battle. Is it our purpose in here to nourish you along and give you religious platitudes and teach you things that are acceptable in your stage of learning only to raise you up to a higher point of learning and say to you that all that that you learned before was really just for the, uh, you know, just for the simple-minded. Now we're ready to take you into the depths of knowledge and show you the true God. That's what he said. Is that what we're here for? He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, whatever Mr. Pike thought, the Lord Jesus Christ did not think. The Lord Jesus Christ was absolute in his thinking, not relative. All right, we'll talk about that next week. We'll pick up the battle. We'll get the nature of the battle when we come together next Sunday morning. That'll be the issue. What's the nature of it? All right, Brother Finoli will dismiss us, please. Jesus' name.